The following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program. I am excited to be here with you this morning. Welcome to Grace and Glory. Got a lot on tap to share with you this morning. But of course, we want to inspire and encourage you and empower you. And to get you jump started, we've got the word, uh, which will be coming from Bishop Dante Hickman, pastor over at Southern Baptist Church. Then, of course, we'll be joined by First Lady Lenyard Robinson with that very special women's segment. So let's go check out the word and then come back and Meet up with uh, First Lady Robinson right here on Grace and Glory. Mark your calendars. Southern will be hosting Revival in Harford County September 15th and 16th. We will gather at our Harford County property located at 514 Joppa Farm Road for Revival at 7 p.m. on Friday night. And then on Saturday, we will host our first annual Impact Day beginning at 12 noon and we will have activities for children, local vendors, food and fun for your entire family. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. By the time of our text, Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly life and ministry. He has demonstrated miracles that no human hand could accomplish apart from the power of God. He has made disciples to be devoted to God, duplicate the work of God, and multiply more disciples in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And he has established himself as the sinless lamb of God that has come to be the savior of the world. Jesus accomplished a great deal in his short time of living and demonstrated how effective and fulfilling our lives could be if we would only commit ourselves to God. Unfortunately, too many of us try to take our lives into our own hands and make a mess out of what God intended to bless. And it's no wonder that we don't accomplish half as much as we could if we would just trust and obey the Lord. Subsequently, as Jesus moves closer to his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, he begins to instruct and inspire his disciples by first preparing them for his departure. In John chapter 14, he starts off this whole soliloquy and discourse by saying, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there, you may be also. Thomas, that doubting disciple, said, Lord, where are you going? How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but by me. He knew his purpose and that it would be fulfilled. But his disciples were growing personally attached to him in the flesh more than in the faith. And don't you know, church, that this is a part of the biggest problem we are having with institutionalized religion today. And that is too many of us are personality driven and not purpose driven. And when the personality dies, our passion for the purpose and the mission dies. A pastor that you like, a preacher that you like, a president in your auxiliary, your lead matriarch or patriarch in the family. Nothing is the same after they die. How many of us had the best Thanksgiving and Christmas meals and cookouts when, when mama or auntie was alive? But when the personality dies, 
somehow we die with it. And many of us today are looking for churches of old that will never come back because those churches represented the personalities of their time and you are supposed to be the new personality. But God is greater than man. And while we appreciate and elevate men and women, we must remember that without God, we can do nothing. Without him, we would fail. Without him, our lives would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Subsequently, you and I must live our lives in shift mode and always living on purpose and not on people. <laughs> This is what Jesus was doing. He instructed and inspired his disciples by preparing them for his departure, but also he was striving to prevent their disconnection. In John 15, Jesus goes on to say, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. And every branch that does not bear fruit, the father takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, the Father prunes it so that it can bear more fruit. He said, resolve, abide in me and my word in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Listen, Jesus didn't come merely to start a ministry, Jesus came to start a movement. And the sustainability of the movement is dependent, listen, upon our constant contact and connection with him. This is essentially why the world and the devil couldn't kill the church during the pandemic. We were the first ones they wanted to shut down and they let the strip clubs and the bars come back before they wanted the church to come back. But they could not kill the church because we are connected beyond buildings. And let me blow your mind, we are also connected beyond technology. We are connected by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. And when heaven and earth passes away, God's word will stand and hold us together individually as well as collectively. That's why we should pray more. That's why we got to fast when we're not in each other's presence. That's why we have to meditate on the goodness of the Lord. That's why we have to worship even when we don't have a choir or a musician or a minister to lead us in worship. That's why we got to maintain the spiritual disciplines because they keep us connected, fruitful, and indispensable. Amen. Nevertheless, by the time we get to John 16. I can imagine the fear and frustration of the disciples when confronted with the fact that the one who made their lives satisfying and significant is now talking about leaving them when they felt they were just getting started. And this should be an example to all of us that our lives are not for our pleasure, popularity, and prosperity alone. God has a defined purpose for our lives that isn't based on our superficial timelines and deadlines. And it's important for all of us to seek his purpose and his will for our lives. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, is what I'm doing pleasing in your sight? Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. But what I love about Jesus in this text is that he demonstrates that the success of the kingdom does not stop with him. 
No, like a military veteran who paid the ultimate sacrifice for our liberties and our living, Jesus gave his life that we might live and live again. And he doesn't leave them to their own devices and imaginations to figure it out. But he says to them, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Can you imagine? After walking with Jesus for three years, healing the sick, raising the dead, unstopping deaf ears, giving sight to the blind, feeding thousands, delivering people from demons. Now he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper will not come. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that quick revelation. That's why some people have to be taken out of your lives because you will never live as God intended for you to live as long as you're walking in their shadow. He said, I got to go away so that I can send to you the helper. And when Jesus said helper, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting to note here, church, that Jesus was talking about eschatology, the study of the end of time, and pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit at the same time. Oh my God, I'm tap dancing on your membrane and you don't even know I'm there yet. Only Jesus could talk about the end of something <laughs> and the beginning of something at the same time. <sighs> Thank you, Holy Ghost. Get, get it? He was doing a Memorial Day and manifesting the next move of God at the same time. And God, my dear brothers and sisters, sent me by here to tell all of us that he's bringing us to the end of one season of our lives while preparing us for the next season of our lives. I dare you to help me preach and look at somebody and tell them some stuff is over for you. But hold your head up because some stuff is just beginning. I know you ain't shouting off that. You ain't as young as you used to be. And you will never be that young again. But you ought to thank God in your older years, you getting better than what you were in your younger years. That's why you walk around talking about, I wish I knew then what I know now. Just take what you know now and live with that. I got more good news because the Holy Spirit says and what you lost in one season God is going to give you the power to recover and sustain in your next season oh come on let's shout about that look at somebody and tell them you're going to be alright don't worry about that arthritis, that bursitis. Don't worry about that blood pressure. Don't worry about that slow walk. Don't worry about your eyes getting dim. You ought to tell somebody, God's still been good to me. I may not have all the strength that I used to have, but I'm still kicking up dust. Somebody shout, you're going to be all right. Matter of fact, somebody ought to shout, I'm all already all right and I'm, I'm 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 preaching this sermon because in this next season Jesus is calling you to be the new Jesus oh this is too deep for a holiday weekend <laughs> you to look at the person beside you and tell them you the new Jesus Whew. that's right Lucy help us Lord and, and I'm wondering <laughs> if you the new Jesus 
How many demons are you slaying? You the new Jesus? How many people are you feeding? You the new Jesus. How many sicknesses are you healing? Oh, you the new Jesus? Don't look at me. Talk to your neighbor. You the new Jesus? Do you have any compassion? Do you have any wisdom for me? Do you have any power? Because it would be a terrible thing if the new Jesus can't do what the old Jesus did. Preach, boy, you doing that thing. That's why on the day of Pentecost, when the Jews were expecting to celebrate the Feast of Weeks, when they were gathering the harvest, that Jesus said that this Pentecost, they would receive more than the harvest of their seed in the soil, but they would receive the help of the Holy Spirit. That would be the harvest of the seed he sowed with the sacrifice of his life. Y'all ain't shout yet. Because God says, I'm going to give you something that you didn't even sow for. He said, I'm the one that's the corn of wheat. I'm the seed that died in the ground. I'm sowing my life so that you can reap an abundant harvest that's called the Holy Ghost. And can I tell you, church, that their harvest was great because it supplied their need at least once per year. But now the help of the Holy Spirit would sustain them with a spiritual supply for every day day of their lives and can I tell you Southern that what God is about to do to us, for us and through us is a lot and enough to be overwhelming but so that it doesn't overwhelm you God sent you some help I dare you to help me preach look at your neighbor and tell him God sent you some help, that's why your anxieties have not gotten the best of you, that's why your depression has not taking you down. That's why your insecurities have not taken over in your life. That's why your frustrations, your confusion, your doubts and your fears have not been able to get the best of you because you have the help of the Holy Ghost. I need everybody that's been born again to throw your head back and shout I got the help of the Holy Ghost. And on this weekend, where we celebrate the memory of veterans and the miracle of Pentecost, I thank God for the help of the Holy Ghost. Whether you know it or not, the Lord has given us individually and collectively a big vision and an assignment to fill, but he also gives us the help we need to get it done. And the Holy Spirit, listen, will help us to do three things and I'm done. The Holy Ghost will help you to overcome your sense of self-importance. Preach Dante. Write it down if you're on the chat. That's what the Holy Ghost is doing for me, helping me to overcome my sense of self-importance. That's what verse 8 through 11 say, when Jesus said, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Not you. The Holy Ghost will convict the world of righteousness and of judgment because they don't believe in me, because I go to my Father and you see me no more because the ruler of this world is judged. When Jesus would depart, it would be the disciples' job to continue to preach, teach, and make disciples and expand the ministry of the kingdom of God. But it would be the job 
of the Holy Spirit to make them effective and transformative in the hearts of people. Not their antics, not their rhyme, not their style, not their charisma and personality, not their voice control, not all of the things that we do melodically. He said, it's the Holy Ghost that will make you effective and transformative in the hearts of people. They could communicate and demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ, but only the Holy Spirit could change someone's heart, mind, and soul. I hope you hear me. And that's important for those of us who think that it's our job to get people right. Look at somebody and tell them, you can't get nobody right. You can't get nobody right before you get y'all got it yourself right. And what I love about the Holy Ghost is that it takes on the fight. He takes on the fight to get us all right. For Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of separation, and of the sovereignty of God. Subsequently, it's not our job to beat the hell out of people. But if we let God be God, and if we love everybody, the Holy Spirit will prick your conscience. The Holy Spirit will polarize the chaos in your soul. And the Holy Spirit will push you to surrender to the call of God on your life. Yeah. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm so glad he found me. Yeah. When I was lost, and I wasn't looking for a savior. See, some of y'all sitting up here talking about, no, Reverend, we got to give them the Holy Ghost. No, I didn't have the Holy Ghost when the Holy Ghost came looking for me. I didn't have the Holy Ghost when he found me in them streets. And I wasn't looking for him. I was seeking love and acceptance in all the wrong places and from all the wrong people. I thought I had everything under control. But I'm so glad that before I knew him, he knew me. Have I got a witness here? And he drew me. And I came to Jesus just as I was. I was weary. I was wounded. And I was sad. But I found in him a resting place. And ever since then, he has made me glad. And ever since then, he's been blessing me and using me in spite of me. Do I have any in spite of me people in the house? Has God made a way for you in spite of you? Has God opened doors for you in spite of you? Has God built a bridge for you? in spite of you somebody ought to help me preach and say the Holy Ghost help me to overcome my sense of self importance but that ain't all he did the Holy Ghost helps us with our short sightedness you think you can't see now you think your eyes getting dim now I can't see sometimes what God has for me that's what Jesus said in verse 12 he says I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now however when the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth because he gonna speak out of his own authority but whatever God says that's what he gonna say Jesus had been teaching the disciples throughout his three-year ministry journey through exhortations, illustrations, confrontations, and demonstrations. But he understood that they had a limited capacity 
to understand everything all at once or even in a short period of time. I remember in my earlier years of pastoring when my predecessor would tell me how much I wanted to know that I couldn't handle knowing right now. I sit there in the study and say, tell me, Reverend. He said, no, you, you, boy, you can't, you, you can't handle everything right now. I said, I can handle it. I'm intelligent. Tell me. No, you, you can't handle it. But, but, but the Lord will show you after a while. And even today, advisors will say to me that I want to know the end from the beginning. And I discovered that I ain't the only one that got that problem. Most of us got that trait honestly from Adam and Eve who wanted to know more than God. And so many of us stay wanting to know stuff we don't need to know yet. Help me preach, look at your neighbor and tell them some stuff you don't need to know yet. Because sometimes knowing causes us to carry burdens that we ain't ready to handle. And I have to admit that there are times when I don't know exactly how to get where I'm going. Sometimes I'm driving in my car and because I'm the man and I've been there before, I start driving and I don't know where I'm going. So you know what I do? I use my navigation system. And, and, and like most of y'all, I put in where I'm trying to go. Although I know a little bit about where I'm going. And sometimes the navigation wants to take me away that seems long and wrong to me. Have you ever been there? Driving in my car. And the navigation says, exit here for 295. I said, no. Why go 295 when I'm already on 95? I don't want to drive all the way out of the way to where I'm going. And you know what my navigation say to me? Well, why you ask me in the first place? And you know what I did, don't you? I ignored my navigation. And I took the way that I thought was best. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, you got it. I ran into a traffic jam. And it's when I hit the traffic jam that I discovered why my navigation was trying to take me another way than the way I was going. Come here for a minute. Because how many traffic jams, how many crashes, accidents, and delays could you have avoided if you would have just been guided by your spiritual navigation? And God sent me by here to tell somebody in this next season of your life, you got to let the Holy Ghost be your guide. Let him guide you in your relationships. Let him guide you in your career choices. Let him guide you in your financial decisions. Let him guide you in your spiritual direction. And let him guide you in every crossroad of your life. And if you let the Spirit guide you, you'll be able to say the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want for he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul and yea though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for the Lord is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And he anoints my head with oil. My 
cup runneth over and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566. Mark your calendars. Southern will be hosting Revival in Harford County September 15th and 16th. We will gather at our Harford County property located at 514 Joppa Farm Road for Revival at 7 p.m. on Friday night. And then on Saturday, we will host our first annual Impact Day beginning at 12 noon and we will have activities for children, local vendors, food and fun for your entire family. Welcome back with us. I am Pastor Lenyar Robinson, and I'm so excited to be back with you today on the women's segment of Grace and Glory. And today is a great day, not only because are the children back at school, and not only because we're getting ready to get into some amazing fall weather, but because today we are highlighting women in business, and it is very important for us to have our space in the marketplace. So today I have a very special guest with me who is doing her thing in real estate and that is Micah English. Welcome Micah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. You are really, really doing some amazing things in your industry and uh, I want you to share with our viewing audience this morning as they prepare to, to go to their churches or worship virtually. Tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got into the industry that you're in. Well, um, okay, how I got into the industry. Mm -hmm. um, at the age, my best friend, mm -hmm. at the age of 19, mm -hmm. she purchased her first home. Oh, wow. And I was with her mm -hmm. and I watched her through the process. Yeah. And saddenly, it never dawned on me Mm -hmm. to follow in her footsteps or to do what she was doing mm -hmm. because it was something in me that thought home ownership was unobtainable wow. for me. Out of your reach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I believe it was at that time where the seed of passion mm -hmm. was instilled in my heart. Mm -hmm. Fast forward years later, um, I went to real estate school, mm -hmm. I got my license, mm -hmm. and it was at that moment that I was determined and dedicated to um, share knowledge yeah. with others um, who were like myself, who did not think home ownership was obtainable, yes. um, to empower others to achieve home ownership, mm -hmm. and just to be a part of the process, to help others win, to yeah. be a part of helping them create generational wealth That's and key. stability for That's their families. Key. That's why a generational wealth is really, the beginnings of it is in real estate, owning mm -hmm. real estate. Was this something that uh, your parents taught you to do or you learned in your household about entrepreneurship at all? Sort of. Mm -hmm. Um, although my grandmother, by the time I was born, my grandmother was retired, mm -hmm. but she was a business owner. Mm -hmm. My grandma, she had a sixth grade education, mm -hmm. but she owned her own store. Mm -hmm. She was a licensed beautician. Wow. And unbeknownst to me, after I became a licensed realtor, mm -hmm. I found out that she was also a realtor. Wow. And then I have uncles, um, my mother's oldest brother he had his own engineering firm oh wow and her other brother he owned a store so it kind of runs in the family it even when you didn't know it's in your, absolutely in the why do you think it's important that uh women my in particularly minority women why do you think it's important that we have our space in industry and marketplace i think it's important because well first let me say it's important for 
minority women to be and to feel empowered. Yes. And we know what we can do when we support mm -hmm. and work for others. Mm -hmm. But it's something completely different when we can take that energy and pour it into ourselves and our dreams and, mm -hmm. you know, our visions. Mm -hmm. And I believe that when we do that, mm -hmm. that it's empowering for others mm -hmm. and it also will change the social and economic mm -hmm. in our community. In our community. In our community, it's about legacy. It's about Absolutely. legacy, it's about building community. And I appreciate what you do. You are a licensed real estate agent and you also do something else, property management? Yes, I also have my own property management company mm -hmm. called KME Real Estate Management. That's amazing. I think it's important that women find a space that they can cultivate that they can be proud about, they can be passionate about. I think there is there's very little that's more powerful than a professional Christian woman moving about in the marketplace. Absolutely. And, and especially as an example to uh, the young ladies that are coming behind us. Mm -hmm. We appreciate what you do so much. For our viewing audience getting ready today, those who may be uh, thinking about home ownership, those who may be intimidated by it, what, how can they stay connected to you uh, so they can follow what you do in real estate? Sure, they can um, find me on Facebook mm -hmm. under Micah English Realtor. Um, they can find me uh, on www.micahenglishrealty.com. That's amazing. Okay, now ladies, gentlemen, connect with Micah English Realty and get ready for your next. But for now, up next is our second spoken word coming from Bishop Jermaine Johnson, pastor of the Life Word of Life Community Church. So stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Good morning and welcome to the Catalyst for Life televised broadcast brought to you by the Word of Life Christian Community Church, where the pastors are Dr. Jermaine Johnson and co-pastor Elder Michelle Johnson, where we believe that it all begins with the word for the word is life. Somebody thank God through inspiration, through personal testimony. Inspiration through personal testimony. Paul gets to chapter three and he begins to let them know, hey, you got to be aware of some things. You got to be aware because many of them are saying you can only do this by works. You got to do this by circumcision. You're like, man, this ain't about circumcision. Anybody know the law? It should be me. But no, I am who I am because of the grace of God operating in my life. I'm I'm educated from the best of them. I'm, I'm from the tribe of Gingerman, one of the most elite tribes. They are a leftist tribe. They are a special tribe. I'm from the best of them. I had the best education in the Jewish system. But none of that matters. Matter of fact, I'm going to testify. I count all these things lost. Everything that was gained to me, I count it lost. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Can I tell you with my my three degrees and two postgraduate degrees and been able to travel all over the world and I happen to be the senior pastor and founder of the greatest church I know, the Word of Life Christian Community Church. Can I tell you, I count all of it lost. I count it as rubbish because what's really important is that I know him, come on, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I thought I had a half a witness. You can get excited about the power, but the glory is in your ability to suffer. I'm going to say it again because it went over your head. Yes, there's power in the resurrection, but the glory is in your ability to suffer. Good God Almighty, I'm going to say it again. There is power in the resurrection, but the glory resides in your ability to suffer for I reckon yet your present sufferings I thought I had about 10 folk who don't like your circumstance I thought I had about 10 real people I don't like this season of my life I thought about I had 8 people I want some things to happen for me right now I want to be married now I want to have kids now I want to be debt free now I want my own business now I want my body working now now. But in the midst of your sufferings, God's word says there's a glory 
that shall be revealed in you. Somebody thank God for the glory. Thank God for the glory of God working in my life. Glory in your tribulations. Why? Because the glory is producing. It's producing perseverance. It's producing character. It's producing hope. Just tell somebody it's producing. Tell somebody else it's bearing fruit. Somebody declare that God's glory is working on you. You can't see it, but that's why you're connected to a community. I can see it. God's glory working on you. Kamisha, God's glory working on you. Yolanda, God's glory working on you. Michael, God's glory working on you. Elisa, Don Wilkerson, God's glory is a working on you. Tamara, God's glory is a working on you. Come on, somebody declare God's glory is working on me. I can't see it, but I trust it. I, I believe it. Come on, somebody declare I can't see it. I can't feel it, but I sure believe it. Look at somebody declare I believe it. If I can't believe it, Lord, help my unbelief because God's glory. Paul just testified. I got all this stuff, but I count it all loss that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Then he begins to say, trainer, brethren, not that I have apprehended. He's testifying. Or, but I, I, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forward to what is ahead. Therefore, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling Latonya that is in Christ Jesus in the midst of this metaphoric uh, Olympic race that he uses in this Greek Roman world that that you got to press uh, that I'm pressing toward a goal uh, it suggests that if I'm pressing uh, I don't feel like it uh, it's a press uh, that I don't have my best strength uh, but I'm pressing in spite of uh, I thought I had about 17 people uh, that can be honest enough to know uh, that I press my way in here this morning uh, I press my way out of bed uh, I'm pressing my way to work in the morning but I got a gold in mind I thought I had somebody here I pressed to pay my tithes today I'm pressing to pay my rent and my mortgage I press at the gas station but I got a gold in mind I press to pray for my enemy matter of fact I'm pressing to pray for myself but I got a gold in mind do I got anybody in here I got somewhere I got to be how I wish I had somebody here you thought this was it you you thought all that God had for you was right here? No, baby. God has plans for you. Somebody thank God that I'm in the plan of God. Just tell somebody, bloom with your planet. I know it ain't the most ideal situation, but press toward the mark. Every day you keep stepping, you are moving closer to the mark. Somebody declare you're moving closer to the mark. God has a compass. Good God Almighty. He has eyes on you. Oh, his eyes is on the sparrow. So I know he's watching me. Look at your name and say, I know he's watching me. If he's taking care of birds, if he's taking care of rodents, come on, somebody declare, I know he's watching me. Chapter one, he, uh, he, uh, ignites appreciation. Chapter 2, he encourages you in the state to receive the impartation. Chapter 3, Elder Piet, he inspires us through personal testimony. When we get to chapter 4, Michael, he invites us to reimagine. Mm, then, uh, but he invites us to reimagine, Kevin, in the midst of conflict. <laughs> missionaries, church folk, you know, sister girls, they in conflict. I don't know if it was over potato salad or macaroni salad. I'm not sure <laughs> if it was over Trina wanted to wear black and white and Jay suggested blue. I'm, I'm not sure, but they, 
they had a conflict. It, it, something going on, and they were faithful workers because every now and then you'll get weary. Your patience will get thin, and things will begin to irritate you that didn't irritate you in previous seasons. That just shows you that you need Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, I need Jesus. I need him. You might not need him, but I need him. I need him. I need him. I know you pray every day, but I still need him. Look at your neighbor and say, I need him. I need him. But, but, but he tells them, he says, look, I need you to settle your disagreement. I need you to, 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 to have wrote this letter to build you up and encourage you in the midst of joy and encouragement to, to remind you that life is going to happen. But we can't allow the disagreement or all that we've experienced to, to overshadow all that has been done. I wish I had somebody. And he tells them, settle it. Look at your name and say, settle it. You're creative enough. You Come on, help me preach. You're creative enough. You're gifted enough. Come on, you are more than conqueror. You, you have, you have, people have died for far less. I wish I had somebody. I know you saved and sanctified, and you don't use that kind of language. Cover your ears real quick. I am. Cover your, everybody cover their ears. You've cussed people out for far less. It is no point of you holding that kind of grudge based on that. I know I got eight real people in the church. So it gives them an invitation that, that I want you to reimagine yourselves by saying this. He, he gives them a preference, a, pre, a, pre, a preference in the first three verses, but then he says, verse four, he says, look, this is, this is what I want you to do to reimagine. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. If you're going to bloom when you're planted, first thing we learn, you got to find joy in the place that you're planted. Oh, wow. But I don't like the place I'm planted. He says, based on what I've done, Based on how I build you up, I told you to ignite appreciation. I told you to take on humility, the one. I told you to give a personal testimony. Based on that formula, I trust that all that you've experienced, that you can sure enough find joy in the place that you're planted. Isn't it amazing that God has more confidence in us than we have in ourselves? Paul saying, based on what I've already outlined for you, find joy in the place that you play, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Just take a moment. And even in the midst of what's going on in your life, I'm sure you can thank God for waking you up this morning. I don't know how you got here. I don't know if it was, I don't know the bus route no more. I maybe need to catch the bus. That's like the 34 runs out there. I don't know if you caught the 34. You walked or you drove. But the fact is, you made it here. And you made it here in your right mind. So find joy in the place you're playing. All that comes to my mind, Elder Vanessa, uh, Chantel, is Friday. When, when Smokey's mother told him to go to the store. <laughs> Latonya... She said, he said to his mother, it's not enough. His mother clapped back and said, make it enough. <laughs> and I want to tell you, I might not have said enough things to stir you up, but make it enough <laughs> that you can find joy in the place that you're playing. Don't tell me the Holy Ghost don't work. I ain't even thinking about it. Holy Ghost gave me that one. Some of y'all going to be like, Pastor, told me to watch this movie Friday. Oh, my gosh, Pastor. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Tiffany, find joy in the place that you're planted. The text also teaches, tailored, text is tailored to teach us, pray in the place that you're planted. Pray in the place that you're playing. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Verse 5 says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in 
everything by prayer and supplication. He says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. Don't be in so into yourself that you are allowing worry to overtake your practice of prayer. We can't be so anxious that our anxiety has uh, been given more power than faith. We're challenged to practice our faith by praying. The author defines faith is not believing that God can. Faith is knowing that God will. I'm going to say it again. Faith is not believing that God can, but faith is knowing that God will. So when I'm wearing, I'm still in the vein that if God can or not, but when I pray, I am making a declaration that I know God will. The old folks would say he may not come when you want him to, but I know he's going to show up right on time. The psalmist says weeping endures for a night, but joy does come in the morning. We sung the song. He can and he will. I want to tell somebody, I don't know your answer. I don't know when you're going to get the phone call. I don't know when the job is going to come through. I just want to tell you, based on the plans of God and you operating in divine providence, that God's will. Somebody say, God will do it. Come on, look at your name and say, God will do it. The rent is going to be paid on time. The mortgage is going to be taken care of. Come on. Huh? You're going to get the prescription in the nick of time. Somebody say, God will. Huh? Come on, that kid is going to graduate. Somebody say, God will. Huh? You know why? Because I'm praying. Is there anybody in here praying? Huh? I'm. Come on, anybody in here praying? Huh? Trina can testify. Come on. Huh? Pray for my boy. And now he's at Hampton University. Hallelujah. On a full scholarship. Come on, that's a product of prayer. Huh? Can you thank God for a product of prayer? Come on, I can testify on her behalf. She prayed, come on. When she didn't want to pray, she prayed. Is there anybody in here can thank God that if God did it for Trina, if he did it for her, if he did it for Taylor, I believe God can do that thing for you. He can bless your child, hallelujah. Find joy in the place you're planted. Pray in the place that you're planted. As a result of prayer, he says, you will receive peace in the place you're planted. I, I, it's right there in the text. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As you are committed to prayer, he says you will receive what? Peace in the place where you are planted. The journey of growth and development of being able to seek and realize a positive benefit from any situation or set of circumstance to bloom where you're planted is simply rooted in your faith. Somebody declare, it's rooted in my faith. I'm standing on nothing else but the faith of God. And he says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen without faith. It's impossible to please God. If I got the faith the size of a mustard seed, it's enough to move a mountain. Thank you, Elder Singletary. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, and he says, you will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on. But Jeremiah 29, he says that he prayed that in the midst of the false prophets, in the midst of all that's going on, in the midst of them being in the Babylonian captivity, being in exile, being in the restricted place, he, the prayer was, and seek the peace of the city, which I cause you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. This is a lesson for you. In the place of restriction, in the place that you are, God's saying there's already a prerequisite, there's already a prearranged a atmosphere of peace right in your circumstance. But you are waiting for the breakthrough before you can experience peace. No, you can have peace right in the storm. 
right in the circumstance, God is saying, I'm right there. So the city in which I carried you, even though it's not the city that you prayed for and the city that you desired, in other words, the situation for your life is not ideal, but you can find peace because God is right there. I know you're waiting for the, the big check. You're waiting for the 25, 75,000, 100,000. I know who I'm talking to, various people. 250,000, 500,000. I get it. I know you're waiting for the big check. But God is right there in the $250 check. He's right there in that direct deposit. He's right there in that unexpected cash app. That, that, that's right there. When you mature enough, uh, you can give him praise right there uh, that I know I ain't got the whole thing, but I'm celebrating him for what I got. And just as Jesus and the disciples in Mark 4 were in the storm and the storm began to rage and they was wondering how Jesus can sleep in the storm and he just woke up and he said, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, wind ceased. And I thought I had somebody that even though you ain't out of it yet, you're going to bloom and celebrate where you planted. Because guess what? There's still peace there. Look at your neighbor and say there's peace there. In the midst of the drama, guess what? There is peace right there. Ow. I know it feels like a different set because you used to celebrating when it's all over. But I'm trying to teach you and give you ammunition that you're going to slay that devil over the head. Even with my bills too much behind I got peace even with uncertainty on my job I got peace even while I'm arguing with your tail I'm experiencing peace welcome back hope you've enjoyed the program today many thanks to of course our spoken word agents of Bishop Hickman as well as a Bishop Johnson for sharing with us today and even as we prepare tomorrow to reflect and remember uh, the tragic events of 9-11 a few years back, uh, I, I am reminded of how the country pulled together and there was a strong sense of unity and patriotism uh, that was the desired response to what had happened. And my, my concern is that if we could be able to embrace and engage in that kind of spirit outside of tragedy, that would be a real triumph something that can grow and be a positive as we reflect on the events of tomorrow. So with that being said, as always, we prepare to leave you. We pray that you'll remain in his grace and in his glory. And we look forward to connecting with you next week right here on Grace and Glory. Mark your calendars. Southern will be hosting Revival in Harford County, September 15th and 16th. We will gather at our Harford County property located at 514 Joppa Farm Road for revival at 7 p.m. on Friday night. And then on Saturday, we will host our first annual Impact Day beginning at 12 noon. And we will have activities for children, local vendors, food and fun for your entire family.